confianza en Cristo Jesús? ¿Has creído que Cristo nació de una virgen y que dio su vida por tus pecados? Basado en tu fe en Cristo Jesús, te bautizo en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church and for this hour of worship. I don't always read the Greek philosophers, but listen to Sophocles. All men make mistakes, but a good man yields when he knows he's wrong and he repairs the evil. The only crime is pride. The only crime is pride. Today we're going to gather around God's Word and talk about change and growth and getting forward and getting free. The offer of grace that comes to people to say, I will guide you to a new life. What it requires of us is humility, the ability to, to know that we are in trouble and that we need the very help of God. Crime really is, pride really is the only crime. Ready? Let's pray together and we'll do this all as one. Let's pray. Hear our prayer today, Father. We turn our eyes toward you. You are a great God, a good God. You are wise infinitely beyond our imagination. You know this world, and you have set your law, and you have set your son, and all of us have offended against it. So we've ended up with circumstances in our lives, some that we caused and some that were caused by others, but we need you and only you. Um, we humble ourselves today. We will kneel, we will sing, we will pray, we will listen to your word, and ask for your spirit to guide us so that we know what we, we must do. Uh, thank you for this gathered congregation and all of its congregations. Thank you for the um, encouragement that we get from your word. Our eyes are on you today, Lord Jesus. They're on you. In your name we pray. Amen.
sing our faith together. Stand as we turn to 185. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He's with me to the end. Are you grateful for that? Amen. I've given up coffee. I have given up chocolate. Two things you have never heard me say. 
If you did, it would look and sound more like this. I've given up coffee <laughs> and chocolate. Hashtag suffering for Jesus. <laughs> it's funny, absolutely. And we hear, particularly this time of year, we hear people say, they, they, they wear it like a coat of arms. This is what I'm giving up. Here's what I'm doing for Lent. Here's, here are the things. And here's my caution. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6. And when you go, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. They disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you have fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who in secret will reward you. You know, friends, as we take this time to focus on the cross and what Jesus has done for us, he may very well ask of you something. It may be a change in your life. It may be a call to service or action, or it may be to excise something from you that, that needs to be taken away. But it's, it's out of your respect and glory to the Father that you would do this and return it unto him so that he may be glorified. So I pray for you as we continue this beautiful season of, of thought of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. May he continue to change and shape and challenge you, but may it be for his glory and his glory only. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we, we know that we are works in progress. We know that there are things that we need to, to give up. We know there are things that we need to do with our lives, a service that we need to provide, action taken. Lord, we do that for you. So, Lord, as you change our hearts, as you shape us today, would you, would you indeed, Lord, stir in us those things that would please you, that would give you honor, and today we turn them over to you with all joy, knowing that we are serving the Father. So it's in these things that we ask and pray. Amen. Let's continue to pray. As I chose this hymn, it was very much with a vision uh, and that the title brought to mind, and the second verse in particular that, we're in, that this river, this, this Nile that brought life also brought death. And, and yet there was this baby. God chose another baby to change someone's story. So as we sing this, the children of Israel are very soon going to be provided for in many ways that they had not expected. So as we sing, stayed upon Jehovah. Let us find our rest. Can we stand and sing this together? Hymn 58. <laughs>
It's a privilege for me to invite the children to come and sit with me. You come. Let's talk about prayer today. While the children are coming, let me welcome those of you who are guests with us this morning. We're so glad you're here. We love that you've joined us today to worship the Lord and hope that that's exactly what happens. Would you give us your name? We just want to know what your name is. You can find that on a card and put it in the offering plate in a little while. Somebody will follow up with you. We'll just be your friends. We're just glad you're here. And welcome to those of you who join us by television. This live broadcast, I know, is reaching into a hospital room or a home, actually all across the world through a live stream. So we welcome you who worship with us all over the world this morning. Thanks. Okay, let's talk today. I know something about you, and uh, I wasn't there, but I still know it. When you were a little baby, when you were a little baby and you needed something at night, you just had to do one thing. You just had to cry. Whether it was a clean diaper or your tummy hurt or you were hungry, you didn't have to know what it was that was bothering you. You just cried out and your mom or your dad or somebody would come help you. That's the way it works with babies. It's kind of like prayer, and I want you to think about it. God is our heavenly Father. And so sometimes when my heart hurts, then I cry out to Him. And just like a little baby, I don't always know what to ask. I don't always know how to talk to Him or what to ask. So sometimes I just tell Him the need. I, I just hold before Him my broken heart. And he hears. The Bible says the Holy Spirit can interpret that. He can know what to pray just because I hold it up to God in prayer. Boys and girls, do you pray? Yeah, sure. Do you pray? Yeah. I pray every day. It's one of my favorite things to do. I learn so much about God when I pray. Now, here's the thing, though. To really pray, you have to be God's child. I became God's child the day I invited Jesus into my life. When I, by faith, I trusted Jesus and he came into my life and forgave my sins. That's when God became my father. And then I learned all about prayer. I began to say, you're my father and I can talk to you about everything. So the thing I pray for you, I pray that someday, very soon, hopefully, you will take Christ into your heart as your savior. You'll receive him by faith. And then becoming God's child, you learn to pray and you learn to pray for other people. And sometimes even when you don't know what to say, he'll help you do that. So we're going to talk about prayer today. When you were a baby and you needed something, what did you do? Cry. You just cried out to your father or mother and they came and helped you. Let's pray together. And so did you write that into the history of mankind? Did you make it certain that all of us would know this at some level? That we had to cry out to you? And when we get to be adults and we forget and we think that we're in charge of our lives and our pride gets in, in, in charge, would you teach us again to humble ourselves before you and cry out for a salvation that comes only for, from you? Jesus, when you were here, you prayed to your Father. Teach us to do the same. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Way to go, boys and girls. I'm glad you're here at church. We're learning about the Lord together. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, sweetie, are you good today? I'm good too. Thanks. Thanks.
God is faithful, and He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape. Provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You want to get away? It's an ad campaign for an airline. And most of us, the answer is yes. We believe that with just a few days away to rest, we could come back and face the challenges that are in our lives. It's salvation by vacation. That's what we basically believe in this culture. The truth is actually deeper. You've had this experience. You get away for a while, you come back. Your life is essentially the same shape. The only way to really have a new nation or a new family or a new marriage or a new conscience is to have a new relationship with God. That's the only way it ever happens. The real problems can't be fixed at a superficial level. They change way down deep, down here in our relationship with God. The only way out is through, said Robert Frost. You don't fix life by running from it, by avoiding it, by covering it over by alcohol or drugs or entertainment. The only way you ever fix life is to face it. The only way you can do that is with the help of God. Over 3,000 years ago, God in his wisdom acted in the Israeli nation. He acted in such a way so that he would not only save them, but create the patterns by which he would save us. It is both true history and symbol. Both of these are happening at the same time. He's such an artist, he shaped the soft clay of history so that it not only accomplished their salvation, but he promised us how he would relate to us in this last of all chapters of human history. It's much more than history for the next 14 weeks. We're going to read one of the most amazing books in the whole Bible. It's called Exodus, Exit, A Way Out. People who are given a way out and then they never dreamed it was possible. You want to get away? Well, it really happens when you begin to answer, no, what I want is God. What I want is God. Let's stand together and we're going to read. It's printed on the back of your listening sheet. We'll read together with great voice. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply. And in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra, and the other was Pua. And he said, When you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if as a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. Now a man of the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer... She got him a wicker basket, covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Thank you. Please be seated. Three hundred years had passed since Jacob and his family had come into Egypt. Around 1500 B.C., the political climate changed. The Jews went from a favored status to mistrust and persecution. It wasn't immediate. It was about a hundred-year gradual shift in the political climate. Gradually, they ended up in labor camps. And then the midwives were told to kill the boys' babies. And then a general edict went out that the babies were to be murdered by the whole culture as a, as a group. You may recognize this evil. The world, which is what the Bible calls human society, 
without God in the center. Human society and all of our values without God in the equation, that's what we call the world, and the world is typically cruel to children. Um, Divorce hurts kids. Sex traffic hurts kids. Abortion. Satan seems to have no end of the ways that he will pour out his animosity toward God up against the most helpless victims of the human race. Exodus is just another example. It turned miserable pretty fast. Dark clouds of the storm rolled in on the people of God and they were in a very different and dangerous moment. Did they remember enough about Jehovah to cry out to him? Did they remember who he was and know how to pray? Maybe. Um, 2-4, uh, chapter 2, verse 24 is in your listening sheet. Uh, God heard their groaning. It may not even have been prayer. It may have just been groaning. Uh, a generalized report to God that things were beginning to hurt. Things were beginning to go in a negative direction. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sometimes it is a breakthrough, and you will mark this just to recognize that we're in a mess. It can be a real breakthrough if you realize I'm living in a loveless marriage, my children are drifting into difficult, difficult sin, I'm in physical pain, our nation is in moral pain. Sometimes it is a breakthrough just to recognize what I'm doing is not working. And that's what what we're marking here. In 2.24, it says God heard them out of loyalty to his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's 200 years ago. He had made promises to those faithful men, particularly Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He'd promised to treat their family in, in a certain way. So now 200 years later, these people began to cry out this generalized agony. Things are not going well. God referenced... Not the people. He referenced Abraham. He remembered what he'd promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's the same way we pray now. When we pray now, God does not reference our merit. He references the merit of Jesus Christ. He looks back to his faithful son and the way his son uh, stood true under all circumstances. And that's why the better you know him, the more you can pray in Jesus' name. You can pray because of what Jesus accomplished. And so this is the first part of this principle by which God will deliver people is we begin to cry out. We begin to cry out. Of course, your pride won't always let you. Sometimes you have to be miserable for a long time. You think, well, I can still do it. I can still do it. I'm going to still use the same principles that have ruled my life. I can still stay in charge of my life. I can still do what I want to do with my career and my body. But sooner or later, it is a great breakthrough when you begin to say, this is not what you meant for life to be like. And so we cry out to you, crying. That's, that's the first principle. Um, waiting, that's the second principle. You will notice, uh, before I leave that first point, Karl Barth saying, to clasp hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising. To say to God, this world is out of order, I now call on you. That's the beginning. The second is to wait. It's no quick fix here. This is, after all, the God of the Grand Canyon. This is a God that some of his best work He doesn't do quickly. He does slowly. He does gradually with a a timing all of his own. And so it's years. It's years of this boiling, coming to a boil need for God again as they begin to cry out to him and he begins to act in their behalf. Now the Bible talks about Simeon waiting on the consolation of Israel, Luke 2. He waited. Um, Galatians 4 says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. So if it is God you want, everyone, if it's God you want, 
then you need to sign up for the whole race. Uh, you, you can't just do part of it. You have to really want his goodness. And that often comes at a time much slower, much longer than what we were thinking. And the first indication that he's at work in your life, it's very often not rescue, it's resilience. The first wave of God's spirit among his people will be just a resilience that doesn't give up under unjust suffering. It just doesn't go away. Uh, this text says the more they oppressed them, the more they flourished. Uh, the Apostle Paul will later call that strength in the inner man, that life is unfair, things are not good. And yet somehow, as you go to God on your knees, He just gives you strength to keep going, even in an imperfect situation. Not to be a victim, not to collapse, not to quit, to... Um, this is the man who keeps on loving his wife and praying for his kids and going to work. And sometimes nobody else notices it, but the Lord himself sees that you are faithful. That you cannot change the circumstances of your life, but you trust him. And that you, so it's, it's often not rescue first, it's resilience to say, as Job said, though he slay me, I will trust him. Um, the children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who said, we may die in this fire, but it doesn't matter. We're not going to worship somebody else. So notice in yourself, dear friends, as we begin to turn back toward God in this hour of our great testing, you notice the people who say, it may not fix in my lifetime, but I'm going to be faithful. I am going to stay with the Lord. And you watch that work of grace happening in their life that causes us to be courageous, whatever the outcomes. The true church gathers for prayer because we believe, not because it's fun. We do not market Christianity with a promise that life will be easy or that your children will be entertained. We do not market the cross that way. We tell people there is a God and He is true and that He will reward all faithfulness. But sometimes it's a long time and you must carry the cross the whole way. We come to church because God is the only way to face our problems and find the truth. The scripture says those who wait on the Lord. So, gentlemen, ladies, do you wait before the Lord? Does, as Aaron says, do your quiet time closet see you regularly on your knees rather than hating people who are doing things across the world rather than resenting things that are happening in our nation do the people of God begin to cry out for him and wait on him does he does the heavenly one sense your prayers and know as you wait on him that he will come to our rescue the principles that are being revealed here the crying out to God the waiting and I'm sorry I can't promise you a fast return. I'm sorry. I'm, my, I myself flesh is insulted by this. But I do know what this says. It will come when it comes. And this God will faithfully answer his people. And if we do not see it in our lifetime, then may our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren see the answered promises to these prayers. And the third, acting. Crying, waiting, acting in faith. In the early years of history, all the cultures of the world had a memory of the true God. In the early years of history, all the cultures remembered the true God. And so when Pharaoh ordered the midwives to kill those baby boys, they knew it was wrong. Hear me. They knew it was wrong to kill babies. And so they said, we will not do it. Probably Shipra and Pua were officials in his government, which makes the acts even that more and more impressive. And God blessed them because at some point those ladies said, N no. It's Corrie ten Boom in Nazi Germany saying, I'll save the ones I can save and it may cost my family, my sister, it may cost me everything, but I will not do it. It's the people of God who say now, the whole culture may slide off a cliff, 
But I will raise my children with a different attitude. I will, they will see me pray. They will see me honor the Lord. We may not be the majority ever again, but they, I will not do it. And so these ladies stood. Sometimes women get it before men. Um, these ladies are followed by the story, and this is the way Moses told the story through the eyes, basically, of his mother. Chapter 2, verse 2 says she saw he was beautiful. Uh, Acts seven twenty says she saw he was beautiful before God. Uh, this is no maternal instinct. That is not, this is no desperate mother. This is a woman who saw the value of her son in the light of the purposes of God. A voice whispered in her heart, says F.B. Meyer, and she took action. And she said, this may cost me my life. It may cost my husband his life. It may cost me my other two children's lives. But I'm not going to do that. And so following the impulse of the Holy Spirit in the way that only he could do it, she went and got a little wicker basket and she put tar around it so it wouldn't leak. And then she takes him down to the Nile. Everybody, the Nile was where they were killing babies. The Nile was the darkest zone in that nation. She takes him into the mouth of the lion because she believes that God will honor her faith. That God will somehow help her if she will do what she has been told to do. So she puts that baby down in those reeds and she weeps out a mother's heart. And she says, I don't know what's going to happen. But I know I've done what I was supposed to do. And every parent has to do the same thing. You cannot control what happens to your kids. But you can finally answer, what did God tell you to do? What was he, was he telling you to do? And you can answer with that same sort of confidence. And she lets that baby go and float down that river. And you know the rest of the story. Hebrews says, by faith, she did that. By faith, she hid that baby. By faith... Because she believed God. And so I say to you this morning, what are you doing this morning by faith? See, I sing sometimes, and I love this song, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. If you mean rest from anxiety, I get that. But if you mean rest from action, it is a distortion of the Christian faith. If you mean rest from obedience and courage and decisive steps... It is not what our, we believe. We believe faith finally has to answer this question, what would you have me do, says Paul in Acts 22. Faith comes from hearing, hearing comes from waiting, and waiting leads to obedience. And so I'll ask you again, this morning, what are you doing because you believe? What will you do because you believe? God, how will you obey for the rest of his life, they called him Moses. In Coptic, the word mo is water and sa is to draw. Mo sa. His Egyptian mother probably gave him that name. The rest of his life, he carried the story. Without God, I'd be dead. Anybody have that testimony? Were it weren't, not, weren't, weren't for God, I'd be dead now. Were it not for God, I'd have no purpose. But my whole meaning in life has to do with the purpose that God has gave, given me. So, much or little, fame or obscurity, pain or pleasure, I will do what God wants me to do. Now, Moses had to learn. He had a lot to learn. His mother learned to wait, and Moses had to learn to wait. Early in his life, he decided to foment this revolution and kill somebody and see if he could stir this thing. Anybody ever tried to fix in the flesh the purposes of the Spirit? Help me here. Anybody ever tried to fix with your flesh what only God could do? So he, he kills a guy and he ends up 40 years later in a different, a different zone. He has to learn to wait. He has to learn to bear up under the criticism of his people. He will come back and think that these people ought to treat him like a deliverer. And they treat him like... Kitty litter. They are after him. He never takes a step the rest of his life that they don't criticize him 
or say he's wrong. They are after him. And all his life he is saying, Father, I just want one thing, and that's your approval. I just want one thing. If I can have your approval, then I will get through this negative, dark period. And the rest of his life, Moses carries that testimony. mo the one who was pulled out of the water. The man who teaches us that if you will cry out to God, if you will wait for an answer, if you will act in, your, act in faith, he will set you free and he will get the glory for it. Ready to pray? Let's pray together. Forgive, eternal one, forgive. Forgive the way we have tried to fix problems that are so much larger than us. Moral issues at the seat of our nation, wrapped into our culture. Marriage difficulties that bind one sinful heart to another and never can find a solution. Children and health, forgive us. Forgive us for ignoring all, the whole time the revealed pattern by which you would come to our aid. You would be a very present help in time of trouble. Thank you for the grace that even today would help us see that a very different path would lead to hope and relief. So people watching this broadcast all over the world, would you give them insight? People watching this broadcast here in our city, would you speak to their hearts? People in this room, people who heard this at an earlier service and still are mulling it over, would you give insight to us that we might follow only you, worship only you? Set the captives free, Father, the way you do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand, please? Uh, I guess this is one of those moments where Jesus used to say, blessed are those who mourn. The truth is, sometimes it takes a while being miserable before you're ready for God. Sometimes if you're just miserable a little while, you say, no, I can handle it. I can handle it. But after a while, after you've been miserable, just the, if you've mourned a while, then you're ready to say, Father, if you'll show me how, we'll do what you're asking me to do. Um, putting God back in the center of your life may be a painful step, but it's the only step that brings life to worship Him, to know Him. Then the relief will come. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to indicate that that is happening in your heart. If today you will come and receive Christ and say, I, I've wandered a long time without a Lord, and today I'm going to settle this. Jesus is going to be my Lord. If you'll take me by the hand, I'll help you do exactly that. Today you can come and say, there are areas of my life, bitterness, unforgiveness, secret sin, that have so corrupted my ability to walk with the Holy Spirit that I'm of no use in this world. You can come and take me by the hand and we'll, do, we'll confess that together and find the grace of God for you. Maybe you can say, I believe this is where I should serve you, Lord, and starting today I will. I'm going to ask you to do it publicly. That's the way Jesus did it. He, he said, if you don't have enough courage to stand up in the gathered group of believers, you, you'll fall before the world. So if there's a decision happening in your heart, will you come take me by the hand and tell me? If there's not, then we'll all go home and know that, Father, you have to work with us more because until the church of Jesus Christ fills with his spirit and people return back to him, there's no hope for this nation, not of recovery. So uh, is there a decision in your heart this morning? Take, me, take my hand and we'll do it together. Let's sing. I'll meet you here.
Do we have any more verses? Here, here's the problem. The church used to sing Sweet Hour of Prayer, and 80% of the people in here knew what that meant. Now we know more about brackets and football and Oscars than we know about that experience. So I want you to pray one more time, and this, make it a prayer. Restore into the church a spirit of supplication, where we gather because we know that if we will, he will hear us. Sing one more verse, make decisions as you make them. Pray, ask him to help. An offering is a privilege for us to give to the Lord. It is an open portal to say, Father, you've given us all things. We took warm showers this morning. We are warm and fed. We are rich. We are rich among all people. And we return back to you as an act of worship. Continue to seek him. you could all sit where I sit as a pastor. Uh, I, I get to see your faces as you listen to the teaching of God's Word. And some of you, I, I just see the, the Lord coming alive in your life. And, and I see all the multiple services, the people that join in different services. So none of us 
get that, that full privilege. So we've been doing a series of videos called um, Created in Christ, the people and stories of First Baptist Church. Watch this testimony of Dorothy Hansen. My name is Dorothy Hansen and I'm 18 years old. Um, I was born in Santiago, Chile, and I came to San Antonio when I was about two. My parents have always been Christians and they grew us up like as a Christian family. We came to the church when I was three. Um, First Baptist feels like a second home to me. Like I come here every Sunday and sometimes on Wednesday nights and the people in my grade feel like sisters to me. They're really loving and caring and they care for me. I first accepted Jesus into my heart when I was about six and but I really didn't like have a relationship with him until I was like in middle school with the youth group. Well, my mom was diagnosed with cancer a couple of years ago, but the way she deals with it and the way she's so strong about it makes me be strong. And just like watching her still love the Lord allows me to grow in my faith and to love the Lord. Well, a lot of people at this church, they have really just like, when they say they're gonna pray for like me and my family or me and my mom, it's just really shows how much they love us and it's just amazing and prayer does do wonderful things and it's grateful and I'm grateful that they pray for me and my family. I really love serving the Lord through mission trips and I love how the church has so many mission trips like Mission Carter and like the small things we do with the youth group during spring break. So I just hope that more people could do that, but it's just such an awesome experience being able to work for God. An experience I will always remember is youth church camp. And that's just like an awesome place where a lot of Christians, we come together and we connect and we just grow more in Him and learn more, learn more about Him. And it's just so awesome. And I've really grown closer to the girls in my grade through that. And it's just awesome being able to call them sisters in Christ. I love this church because I have grown up here and it's just been an amazing second family to me. And being loved by all these people and being able to love back and being able to worship Christ together is just an amazing thing. And it's an amazing place to be at. Pastor and church family, we have uh, Nick West coming today. Nick, Stephanie, you can come with him there if you would. Stand up here with the pastor if you would just a moment. Nick comes today. He's a Christian. He just comes asking prayer as God leads him in uh, restoring some relationships and just honoring him with his life. Also, uh, J.D. and Linda Darcy. Uh, J.D. and Linda, they have their grandkids with them today. Uh, they come on a promised letter from a sister church here in our area, coming to place their life in service with us here at First Baptist. Nick, the first time I knew Nick and his wife, I, I found out that they went to marriage in 3D. They came with the levels. Um, we are just thrilled that God's connected you with our lives. J.D. and his wife, they've been visiting for some time. They've been very careful about where God would have them to serve. These granddaughters are standing with them today. Both, all three give testimony of a relationship with Christ and a desire to serve Him better and know Him more deeply. If you're happy with the pastor to welcome these folks into this fellowship, and you will say that you'll be a New Testament church so they can be a part of it, would you indicate by saying, I, I and I we do. We really, really do. Okay, Robert Schoner, if you'll take these folks to the front door, we'll come by and love on you. It'll be a symbol of our love. They won't get all the names today, but it will be a start. It will be a start. One of the things I like best about First Baptist Church is the way you work. You guys work at your faith. This morning, probably 1,200 people were in Bible studies across this campus. 1,200 people were in a Bible study in today. And over 200 volunteers made that happen. Bible teachers, administrators, baby rockers, student friends, college challengers. There's a, over 200 folks got here early this morning to make Sunday school work. 
Next year is going to be our best year ever. I'm convinced we're going to do a schedule change. The internationals are going to go to one schedule. It's time for them to have a little bit more autonomy and responsibility. But they're still going to need a lot of English help. They want to do their children, their youth, and many of their adult classes in English. So we'll be asking for your help, not only there, but preschool. Can you rock a baby? Can you? Some of you guys have been studying the Bible for 87 years. Could you help somebody now? <laughs> Could you begin to tell some people about the love of Christ? We'll be asking you to help us. It's going to be exciting. Um, you'll note the Easter schedule. On Easter, we'll have a sunrise service. It's just so much fun unless it's freezing cold. But it's sunrise service and then breakfast, and then an opportunity for special Sunday school. It won't be reverse. I'll teach one class. Danny Panner will teach one. And then we'll go in with the regular schedule. So be aware of it. Be inviting people to come. Uh, You'll note the other um, announcements in your worship bulletin. really is good to be the people of God, and he is helping us. So let's stand together, and we'll be dismissed.